that first variety that I had, that Utrecht, uh, one year it was still green and it froze a couple times. I got the seeds out and they looked so bad that if a seed grower or seed, seed cleaner was looking at it, it would be just dockage, it would be just thrown in the garbage. I did a germ test and it was 19 out of 20 within 24 hours. Wow. So even frozen, shriveled up garbage was still able to produce a good germ rate. These are the kinds of things that we need. We need to, you know, if it snows, if it freezes, you can go out after and it's still going to be usable. Whereas a lot of the new varieties, as soon as you, you know, as soon as you get a bit of a frost, it's done. Hey folks, I'm Christian and this is the Ice Age Farmer podcast, mapping a path forward, sharing knowledge and building communities and certainly growing abundantly as we enter the grand solar minimum in our ongoing pursuit of solutions to empower and encourage individuals and families to grow their own food in these times. Um, I'm pleased today to share with you a conversation I had with an individual who's got a wealth of experience and expertise with ancient grains, heirloom varieties of wheat and uh, and beyond. So before we get into the, the goods of that conversation, two upfront notes that I wanted to include here. The first being that uh, Brent and I talk about several awesome things, including a book from a single seed by Stefan Simcoe um, that I've added links to below this conversation down in the description. So you can find links to that as well as to ancient cereal grains.org, the, uh, the Indian super seed that he makes reference to that was, um, not engineered, but was bred specifically for the purpose of ending world hunger and then just thrown away. So, um, some of these great things you'll hear more about shortly here. I also wanted to say a special thank you to my Patreon supporters who are making it possible for me to create content like this. Every Patreon supporter, even at $1, is very meaningful and appreciated. So thank you for that. And you can find links if you like this content to help support it below. All right, having said all that, let's get into the goods. Let me now introduce my guest. Brent Stumpf is an organic farmer and a grower of heirloom varieties of wheat. He has been sourcing, collecting, growing, and saving seed from a number of grains for over two decades now, and joins me today to discuss some of what he's learned, describe some of what he's seeing in Saskatchewan as we enter the Grand Solar Minimum, and share with us also how we can make use of these grains' unadulterated genetics to produce food for our own families. Brent, welcome to the program. Well, thank you. I'm thrilled to have you here, and I'm excited for this conversation today. Before we start talking about some of these grains, just help me get to know you a little bit more. Did you know that you'd be growing ancient grains when you were in high school, or what were your what were your aspirations back then? Uh, well, basically, when I was in high school, it was uh, when I grew up on the farm. Uh, I was always told there's no money in farming, so go get a job. So there was there was always a tendency to push me away from farming but uh that it never leaves you mm-hmm. <laughs> once once you've got this, the farming in your blood that's it's there so you know it took a uh, uh, quite a long time to get back to where i could get some land and actually go back to doing what i'm meant to be doing and are you from saskatchewan originally yeah okay when did you learn about the grand solar minimum uh that was about a year ago Okay. How's that been for you? Uh, it's been a, uh, a lot of education. Uh, not really much of a surprise, but because, uh, you know, when you're farming, you, you're very familiar with cycles and you're very familiar with uh, reading what the, what the climate is doing. So, you know, it, it, just, it just filled in a lot of blanks. Mm-hmm. And tell me more about that. Like, um, did you try to tell your family or, you know, how did that play out? Uh, well, when you when you talk to farmers, especially the older farmers in the area, they're always talking. You know, this year was like whenever. Like last year, we had a bit of a dry year. Well, well, that was like 1961. And then if we had we had about 18 years where it was just cool and wet, and they said, well, yeah, that was like the late 50s. So there's there's always talk about cycles. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's when you start bringing up that. The sun controls everything, and trying to explain <clears throat> all the different factors that go into that, then their eyes kind of glaze over, and they have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's when the eyebrows go up. Yeah, and so uh, there is, yeah, that tendency to try and tie it back to what's known. I think that's natural. And so, what changes are you seeing? Changes in the climate already in Saskatchewan, and how is it affecting growing? 
Uh, we've always had uh, different kinds of weather here. Uh, the general consensus amongst farmers is, yeah, well, it's the weather, and it'll, it's, it's always going to do what it's going to do. And oh yeah, we got snow in September, but it's, it's going to get better. And it, there's, there's always that optimism. Uh, even my dad, he's seven, he's in his seventies. And when I said, you know, we've never had this before, where we got, got this snow in mid September, and it, it stuck around. Mm-hmm. And he says, "Oh yeah, we've had it, but you know, we we usually have a snow and then it smartens up." <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this time it didn't. Yeah, yeah, and so we start to have these events where, like, the, like we said, the natural tendency is to tie it back to the last time you saw this or things that 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 make it familiar to us. But when we start to have these events and you see people seeing, I've never seen it like this in my lifetime. You know, this is one that's not in the record books. Then, uh, yeah, it, it starts to get harder to justify. Yeah, yeah, and uh, this year I decided I was going to start making predictions. Um, last year, last winter, the the mainstream predicted a uh, a warm winter with lots of snow, and I said that's going to be the opposite here. It's going to be no snow. It's going to be cold, and I did that uh, by looking at uh, the muskrats because depending on how they build and where they build in the slough determines what your winter is going to be like. And uh, then this year, back in March or April, I predicted uh, frost late May and frost in late August. Uh, Late May, uh, it was plus four on the day that I predicted the frost. Uh, The mainstream two weeks in advance were saying plus seven. Uh, August, we got a frost. The mainstream two weeks in advance were were still saying seven to ten degrees. And that was based on the moon. And did you also mention muskrats? Did I hear that right? Yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, that's a that's kind of a common thing here. If you're one of the older farmers, they'll they'll look at how the muskrats build their houses in the slough. If they're built on the edge of the slough and they're really tall, it's going to be a cold winter and lots of snow. Uh, if they and this last last year they built in the middle of the slough, really small houses, so there was going to be no snow, and uh, and it was a lot colder than they said it was going to be. That's am- that's amazing. I- so nature, nature tells you what you what you need to know. Yeah, you got to know where to look, though, and it's you know so many of us have been disconnected from these traditions and from these little bits of wisdom that are in fact the uh, the telltale signs of a cold winter coming. So it's yeah, like you said, there's always that pressure to move away from the farm. So it's almost as if we've been pushed away from from our roots from this knowledge. Yeah. Awesome. Let's get into the wheat. How did you start growing heirloom varieties of wheat? Tell me about that. Uh, that was probably about 20 years ago. We have uh, the, the city that I'm um, about 25 miles away from. Um, they do demonstration plots every year. And this one one year, they had in their demonstration plots a wheat called Utrecht, which is a, a hulled variety, kind of like spelt or emmer or einkorn, but it's got beautiful blue heads and blue ons. So I got some of that seed, and I, I grew that and found out how how gr- really good it grows and how hardy it is that really got me searching for all the different varieties that are out there and uh right now i've probably got over two dozen barley varieties and about a dozen wheat varieties along with uh, beans peas uh millets amaranth all all different types and you are an organic farmer as well so is this um, just sort of a, a side part of your farm that you use for this, or how does how do those play together? Yeah, I the, like the farm comes first, so my plots they mm-hmm. don't get the attention they should, but yeah. um, it's it's all connected. So where did you find uh, beyond those initial batch? Where did you find these over the years? I just started searching online, and there's uh, uh, seed companies all over the world that you can source seed from. You just have to kind of know where to look plus we have uh I, i'm pretty sure everyone has a local seed bank that they can access we have uh university of saskatchewan has a seed bank and i got uh, an older variety of flax that i couldn't find and i also got an older variety of barley that i couldn't find anywhere that's great tell me about the red fife uh well the red fife is, is probably uh one of the first wheats that were ever grown in canada and uh it is very unique in in that it it adapts to its its uh, environment. Um, 
it'll grow three feet high if it's if it doesn't have any competition. Uh, I noticed in in my plots, if there's weeds that are higher than the than the grain, it'll grow to the height of those weeds. It'll grow six six feet high if it has to. It also it also can handle some frost. And so, where did it come from? Uh, I believe uh, it was a um, an import or bred by uh, a grain breeder out of Ukraine. Uh, a lot of a lot of our original wheats came from from Ukraine. Yeah, it's an amazing story. You you sent me the the book from a single seed that that uh, sort of told the tale of its its uh, arrival via Irish family members of uh, what was it David Fife, and they sourced it from the Ukraine. Yep. Something that would be hardy enough to to get through the Canadian winters. I just thought that was an amazing story, and I did. Uh, I will link to that a PDF of that of that book below. I just thought that was really worth worth sharing. Yeah. I, uh, you know, it's also it's also good to to know that you know when they talk about surviving the Canadian climate back in the eighteen hundreds, late eighteen hundreds, it was it was cold. Mm-hmm. Like the, we didn't have a very very nice climate. So anything that would survive back then uh, is is what we have to be going back to. That's exactly right. Yeah, and that's why I thought this conversation was an important one to have. So tell me more about these grains because you know many other people just sort of see grains and wheat as something that is like to do it at a level that produces for your family seems like you'd have to do it at scale that would require machines and resources and lots of space so help me understand better how wheat can fit into a homestead well um in when i get a a seed variety that like from the gene bank i got 200 seeds of flax uh i got 65 seeds of uh, barley so i put those in the greenhouse the first year to protect them and when you're talking about greenhouse growing, it's closer to ideal conditions, and you get a real sense of the genetic potential of those of those particular varieties. And uh, the flax, to give you an example, growing it at field scale, like I do, uh, the the variety that I grow in or in a average organic situation will will produce about 15 bushel an acre. Uh, conventional in this area is around 20. But this flax in the greenhouse, when you figure out the yield per acre, it was closer to a thousand bushels an acre. So you can grow a small plot and give yourself enough to last uh, to the following year. Wow! And what kind of what kind of flax was that? Uh, it's called Noralta. And even out in field scale, well, not so much field scale, but the uh, plots that I grew, um, it worked out to twenty bushel an acre where the standard variety that everybody grows is 15. So this variety will out-yield conventional production. And is there a lot of labor that goes into that at that scale? Uh, it depends. Like, you can do it by hand. Like, you can probably thrash out enough by hand to for your own family quite easily. Um, same, with, same with most of them, except for the hulled varieties like spelt, um, einkorn, um, Emmer stuff like that that has a hull that has to be taken off, then it's a it's a lot more work. Mm-hmm. But there are so many varieties out there that are just they're easy to thrash, they're easy to grow. Um, in a homestead situation, you can grow a small plot and have enough to do whatever you need to do. That's fantastic. Now, when you're growing flax, is that for the oil that you're getting from that? Uh, it could be, but uh, what? Uh, yeah. What I grow for myself is just we grind it up and we just use it on our on our oatmeal or cereals or or things like that. Or and what I sell for or grow for sale goes to a crush plant and they make oil out of it. Yeah, that's a great way to just mix in some omega threes and nines on top of whatever you're eating. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, okay, tell me more about the other. So that's flax. Tell me about more varieties. Uh, well, the the uh, variety of Barley, every time I hear one of my neighbors say, you know, we had this really good variety and uh, they just went away from it and I'd go and find it and then grow it. Uh, there's a uh, barley variety that they that we grew in the 80s called uh, Diamond. And I got these seeds from the university. I put them in the greenhouse. The seed rate would, would equate to 0.3 acre uh, uh, 0.3 bushels per acre 
and the normal seed rate out in the field is roughly two to three bushel an acre. The yield I got off equated to 381 bushel an acre. Wow. That barley would, in a conventional system, go 80 to 100 bushel an acre in the field. And so at this point, it's worth asking because just from an economic sense, the return on that is ridiculous. And so how did we get in a situation where, I mean, you said they were using this in the 80s. Yeah. So <laughs> remind us, how do we make such a poor decision to step away from these in the first place? There is an entire industry built around grain uh, plant breeding. So without mm -hmm. new varieties, these people don't make money. So it doesn't matter how good the variety is that you have. There's going to be a new variety next year. And they're going to push that variety on all the farmers. And a conventional system is a lot more like that because the grain buyers in the conventional system will only buy certain varieties. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the organic side, pretty much if it makes spec, they don't care what variety it is. I'm just trying to understand that. Usually if I come to market with a subpar product, people just don't buy it. Yeah. Well, to the consumer, to the end consumer, they don't care. They don't care what your yield is. They don't care how good the crop looked. They don't care how much you spent growing that crop. They're just buying the end product. But to the to the farmers, it's, uh, you know, oh, we, we can put more fertilizer. We can use more chemical. We can get more yield. Well, yes and no, because now what's your net out of that? You can get more yield, but how much, how much are you netting at the end, and is it sustainable? In other words, because you're paying more for the fertilizer and all the things that you're now able to put in. Right. So was there a deception initially that, that got people to buy into this? Well, that's, that, even when I was on the farm, my grandparents and my, my dad and that were all conventional farmers. And every year it was, yeah, here's a great new variety. Um, we're going away from this other variety because, you know, the, the uh, plant breeders have... Have all this have done all this work, and we've got these new varieties, and they're they're bigger, better, whatever. And guys would grow it and go, well, we had a better variety before, but now it's not available because the seed growers aren't growing it. Oh, it's just painful. It's staggering. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, einkorn is it worth mentioning that variety as well. Yeah, uh, there's there's several varieties of einkorn. That was one of the first wheats that was uh, cultivated about 10,000 years ago. Wow. And I've got the standard hauled variety, and I've also got a variety that uh, doesn't need dehauling. It's like a regular wheat. Uh, it's a, it's a lower yielding, but like anything else, it, it's been around for 10,000 years, and it's going to be probably around for another 10,000. Wow. Do these... This is what people are calling the ancient grains that if you, yeah. you know, if, if you're in the circles of people who are trying to avoid uh, gluten and stuff like that, they actually indicate that it wasn't always the case that grains had these things. Are, are we talking about like gluten-free grains here? Naturally gluten-free grains? Uh, not gluten-free. It's a okay. different gluten. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, your, your spelt, emmer, and einkorn are the three main ancient grains that everybody talks about. And it's just a different gluten profile. Um since probably the 40s, they've really, really changed the plant breeding. And since 1961, there's actually a video I saw where they advertised that our scientists have fixed the gluten in wheat so we can make better bread. Mm -hmm. So that is the problem. They, they make it commercial, and they don't care about the nutritional. Or the health effects of it. Yeah. It's yeah. Massive health effects coming from these changes. Um, wow. Are there particular varieties of the spelt or emmer that you want to mention? Uh, not uh, the emmer. There's a there's a couple varieties. There's a darker, uh, darker hulled variety, and then there's the the standard variety. Um, they're just generally just called emmer or spelt or einkorn. Uh, they really don't have a variety uh, name attached to them too often. Okay, because you're already in the specific grain at that point. Yeah, like I grew a spelt. I can't remember. It was an actual variety name. It was a it was a newer variety, mm -hmm. and uh, it's called. It was an identity protected uh, version. So basically, everything I grew had to be sold, and I'd have to buy new seed every year. So I told my grain buyer. I said, you know, there's some that be holes in the combine. If I take that and reseed it, it should naturally select to an easier to thrash. Um, 
product. And he told me, well, a grain grower who is conventional said that it won't work because what it dehulls in the combine won't germinate. <clears throat> I, so uh, I says, you know, I've been working with ancient grains for 20 years. You can't stop them from growing. <laughs> so I went and did a germ test on what I had, and it was uh, 95%. When I got my seed the following year from the conventional seed grower, theirs was 85%. Mm-hmm. So what I grew organically was better than what they grew conventionally. That's remarkable. Now, were you breaking contracts by doing that? Uh, no, not doing a germ test. Okay. But uh, um, just I did that for my own knowledge, and I told my buyer the same thing. I says, you know what, we're the seed that I'm growing is better than the seed that I'm planting. <laughs> and he says, well, yeah, well, that's the the thing with identity protected contracts, and a, a lot of the new varieties are identity protected. Mm-hmm. That's how they make money. That's out of control. Are the methods for growing? So we've talked about a few different grains. Are they? <laughs> I guess, let me step back. You've got two decades of experience growing these things, yep. but try to break it down for us a little bit anyway. There's a lot of language that's specific to greens when I go out and look at, you know, how do I do this? So even just listening to you talk about it will be helpful, I think, to a lot of us. <laughs> but take me through a season. Where do I start? Should I try for a winter wheat crop or one of these varieties in particular lend itself to beginners? What do you think? Um, well, when it comes to winter wheat, that's a that's an interesting one because there's, Two different versions of winter wheat, especially from my perspective being up in Canada. Our mm-hmm. winter wheat is planted in the fall. It starts growing. It goes dormant. And in the spring, it grows again after the snow melts. And you harvest that probably around August. Winter wheats in other parts of the world don't mean winter wheat. It means the wheat that is grown during the cooler winter season that really, for us, is kind of a vacation spot because it's warmer. So it's a different, uh, a different terminology b- based on where you are. Mm-hmm. So I plant, I planted uh, oh probably a good dozen new varieties this year. Uh, some of them were called winter wheat. Uh, one, for example, is Rouge de Bordeaux. It's an 1800s uh, bread wheat, and I've been planting that as a spring wheat, and it's actually called a winter wheat by some companies. So this year, I am I put some out as a winter wheat would be, and I'm going to see what it does in the spring. But uh, I do have another one called Phoenix, which is a winter wheat. I planted it in the spring. It came up, but it never made any seed. So now it'll go dormant. It'll come up in the spring and make seed. Um, same thing happens with fall rye. Uh, you can plant it in the spring, and it'll just come up four or five inches and stay there. Winter comes, kills it back, it comes back in the spring and makes seed. That's that's a, t- a true winter crop. But for somebody starting out, it's pretty simple. You just go out in your garden, throw some seed on the ground, and let it grow. <laughs> you sure know how to make it sound easy. <laughs> well, I, I, I make observations. Uh, I see things that, that are obvious that a lot of people kind of miss. Uh, one was, well, you can't seed canola, you can't fall seed canola, but we're going to go out there in the spring and spray uh, to kill the, the canola that came up in the spring from the last fall because it's a volunteer that came up in, a, in the wrong crop. Um, when I do my crops, I always have a volunteer crop within whatever I'm seeding that came up from the year before. So whatever, whatever seed is lost in the field, it, it gives me a crop the next year. Nature, fall, nature seeds in the fall. Okay, so tell me about my first season of growing wheat then. Uh, well, being in California, depending on your frost-free days, uh, your last frost date, uh, you, you take your last frost date and you can go out and just make some rows in, the, in, in your garden or wherever, <clears throat> put out some seed. Uh, it can go down half an inch, three-quarters of an inch, and, you know, if it's dry, you could water it. If not, let nature take its course. And, and uh, within 90 to 100 days, you're, you'll have a harvest. Fantastic. Almost everything is location dependent. And so rather than recommend specific varieties, would your recommendation be to find someone who's doing this locally, uh, source some seeds from them, and then run with those? If you can, yes. 
if not, what I do is I'll, I, I have a uh, three-year rule. I'll go out and I'll get us. I'll put out my seeds, and I'll grow them the first year. If it's a failure, I'll grow it the second year. If it's a failure, I'll grow it a third year. And if it's a failure, then I'll, obviously it won't grow in this area. But you learn why it failed. Mm-hmm. You don't just say, well, it failed. Um, you know, there could be it was too dry or there was a hailstorm or somebody's cows got out and ate my crop, <laughs> that kind of thing. And uh, let's step back again. And then, you know, as an organic farmer in general, what are some of the uh, the practices that have that have turned out to be the most successful that you that are relying on now? Uh, probably, well, in my area, uh, tillage is, is probably one of the, even for conventional farmers, uh, fall tillage is, is a, a real bonus. You can really increase your yields. Um, timing of tillage, I've got a organic, organic neighbor that's been organic for 20 years, and he's always got crops, and a lot of times they're nicer, nicer looking crops than the conventional guys. And uh, I asked him one time, I says, how do you do it? And he says, I work the land, I wait four days, I work the land, and I seed. That's it. So mm-hmm. that's kind of what I go to. I look at who's, who's successful, and I do what they do. Yep. Nice. All right. Well, um, any other for folks? I really want to make sure that folks have enough here to, to go off and start and, and feel confident starting their own um grains for their family Mm -hmm. and so i had looked up and seen that at least here in the u.s you can find some heritage grains seeds from bountifulgardens.org ancient cereal grains.org sustainable seed co.com i did find salt spring seeds.com in canada but they are not shipping to the u.s at all (laughs) under any circumstances um any others you wanted to throw out there yeah uh another good one is the kusa that's uh K-U-S-A, Kusa Seed Society, and they're out of California. Okay. And as an example, I've got their website up here. As an example, they've got, uh, let's say, this uh, Gurkha is a wheat variety. Uh, it was grown, uh, not sure if it says 1900, uh, grows four feet to six feet in height. Uh, t- it took multiple nights of 16 degrees Fahrenheit. And it didn't hurt the crop. Mm-hmm. They haven't GMO'd anything that'll touch these varieties. They GMO for, you know, so you can spray them. Or they GMO so it'll kill bugs. But they've never actually GMO'd something that'll grow better. And are you, so you're you're hinting at looking for hardier varieties? Hardier. Tell me a little bit more about that. How Yeah, how have you adjusted your plans for what, what it looks like we're going into here? Uh, well, going back to that original... That first variety that I had, that Utrecht, uh, one year it was still green and it froze a couple times. And I, I harvested some, I let it dry down, and I got the seeds out. And they looked so bad that if a seed grower or seed, seed cleaner was looking at it, it would be just dockage. It would be just thrown in the garbage. Mm. I did a germ test, and it was 19 out of 20 within 24 hours. Wow. So even frozen, shriveled up, garbage was still able to produce a good germ rate. These are the kinds of things that we need. We need to, you know, if it snows, if it freezes, you can go out after and it's still going to be usable. Whereas a lot of the new varieties, as soon as you, you know, as soon as you get a bit of a frost, it's done. I have a white wheat variety, soft white wheat, that it looked like a 40 bushel crop. We had two nights where it was uh, just at the freezing or a degree below freezing, and it pretty much cut the yield in half. It's really hard to hear that through these seed creation companies that they're just literally doing damage to the genetics over time like that, making more fragile crops. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, talking to a plant scientist a few years back, I can't remember who it was, uh, how he described the old varieties to the new, he says, like, for example, let's say you take a, uh, an old variety that gets 40 bushel an acre, a new variety that gets 40 bushel an acre. You apply fertilizer and a conventional system to both. You might get 50 bushel an acre out of the old variety, but you'll get 70 out of the new one. They're designed to respond better to inputs I see. because they want to sell you inputs. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say anything about the nutritional value, but just yield. And have you, have you tried that Gurkha as well? 
Yeah, I grew that this year. Um, like pretty much everything that I grew uh, had success at some at some level. Uh, some better than others. Of course, you're going to have the varieties that are uh, going to just do better. Um, I got barley varieties that were actually meant to feed the world, developed by uh, scientists in India, and uh, they have higher protein than wheat. They were bred to grow in in bad soil with no inputs and give high yield. Those are the varieties that we need. Yeah, that's exactly what we need right now. Any other thoughts on growing in the future or plans for preparing you wanted to share? Uh, well, basically, it's I'm, I'm uh, building a bigger greenhouse or actually turning part of my workshop into a greenhouse, uh, more development of the older varieties, moving my, my cropping to shorter season, going with more barley and oats rather than the wheat and flax. Um, generally grow more food and uh, store up what we need. Uh, when I read Anita Bailey's book, uh, Cold Times, it was basically reading my childhood. That's how we grew up. We harvested in the fall, and that had to last us to the next fall, to the next harvest. Mm-hmm. And that's that's just the way things were back then. Yep. It sounds like you're ahead of the game then, at least with that understanding. Yeah. It's, yeah. Like, it's like, okay, well, if, if everything goes south, then I just go back to the way I grew up. <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. And you're lucky and to, to have a connection to that and to be able to, you know, understand that and sort of um, feel back as to how things were and revert to it. Because I think that's why I have you on yeah. is because I think a lot of people are lacking that connection and even that understanding and certainly wondering oh, yeah. how, to, how to move forward from here. In fact, I, you know, I, I was reminded of Helen Keller's quote, the only thing worse than being blind is to have sight, but no vision. And I fear a lot of us uh, right exactly. now, yeah, I fear, I, I'm afraid a lot of us can see what's coming, but we're not, we're really struggling to translate that into a vision of how we fit into that future and how we can contribute meaningfully or even just support our family. And it, it's a, it's a difficult future to, to really integrate. So I, that's why I really appreciate your coming on to share, um, mm-hmm. as more and more well, people, so many, yeah, so many people don't have a background. They, like they, they're 98% of the population live in cities and most of those are so disconnected from, agriculture they have no idea even where to start yeah that's exactly right and that's why i appreciate your coming on and i know folks appreciate hearing from you as well how can people find you or support your work uh well uh, supporting my work is the, is the hard part because there there are no no grants or or money available to to do anything on the natural side i i looked at a ten thousand dollar grant a couple of years ago and all it was was reaffirming what they already believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to correlate a way to check crops and food for nutrition to to make it easier for, for consumers to go out and say, well, this is what I want. And they said, well, no, that's never been done before. We want you to uh, use this grant to go and do cover crops and see what kind of results you get. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the grant system is set up for you know, re- reaffirmation of, of existing ideas. Yeah. There's no money out there to uh, develop new ideas, to develop what, I, or to do what I'm doing, to develop different systems that are integrated to survive what's coming. Yeah, it is just a, a reinforcement mechanism there. Yeah, yeah, basically that's, that's all it is. It's, it's, yeah, we'll give you a grant, but you have to tell us what we already know. <laughs> that's right it sounds like uh climate science all right uh any <laughs> final thoughts brent <laughs> uh not really just uh, uh you know everybody's just got to take a look at what's going on and and figure out their needs versus their wants because that that's a big thing like we you know we all want our you know our power and our running water and our internet and telephone and everything else but what do we need we need food we need shelter we need water that's it that's that's three. Uh, basically, when I look at resources, it's uh, water, wood, and wildlife. Beyond that is a bonus. Terrific. Beans, bullets, and bad aids you can buy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brent. Thanks so much for taking the time to come on and have a conversation with me today. I really appreciate it. No problem. And I'd like to thank Brent again for coming on the show today. As well, I'd like to thank you for watching it and for sharing this with your friends 
and family and everyone because my friends we're all in this together and the more of us that are aware of the natural cycles of climate and the changes that we're heading into the better off we'll all be that's especially true as the censor uh, censorship ramps up so i especially thank you for sharing the word right now thanks for watching folks i hope you're doing well and you're taking steps today and every day to ensure your food continuity in the future take care